Hello, everyone. It's Monday, August 8th. Today on The Final Bar, we'll approach the market from three directions. Top-down macro, bottom-up stock picking, sector rotation. We'll talk about the big picture, the S&P, the NASDAQ, pulling back through the course of the day, gapping higher, but trading lower, ending up essentially unchanged as the S&P is testing that 4150 to 4200 key resistance range. On the sector side, REITs, pretty defensive at the top of the list, and a number of stocks reporting earnings this week. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hey, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller, Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com and a sunny and hot Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the power of stock charts, using data visualization techniques, the best practices of technical analysis and behavioral finance to try to make sense of these markets in uncertain times. Sort of an interesting trading day today. We gapped higher at the open. So earlier in the day, I'm looking through a series of charts in my morning coffee routine, uh, which is just uh, today, just after the uh, the U.S. market open. And I'm struck by how quickly we're now uh, not just testing resistance, but you know, powering into it. I'm thinking, boy, we keep moving at this trajectory. We could actually close above 4,200 today. What a difference the day makes, right? Because by the close, we're actually down just a touch with the S&P down 0.1%, essentially unchanged for the day, along with the uh, with the NASDAQ and the Dow, all, all essentially flat. Sort of a holding pattern here as, uh, as Monday's session is done. At the end of the day, this market moves higher if individual stocks are able to eclipse key resistance levels and power through them. When we look at some of the individual charts today, particularly candle charts, you'll find that is not basically what we, thought, what we saw uh, in today's trading session. We'll get to a lot of charts here in a few moments. I did want to let you know about our upcoming guests because to, uh, this week, we actually have three really solid guests for you. On Tuesday, the 9th, Ari Wald from Oppenheimer. On Wednesday, the 10th, JC O'Hara from uh, MKM Partners. And then on Thursday, the 11th, Mark Newton from Fundstrat. Three of the street's top technicians with wide followings in the institutional community it will be a lot of fun to hear what they are telling their clients and what they can share with us about their perspective right about now. Also, last week, we had a lot of really good special content that aired on this channel. If you missed any of it, I would uh, I would check it out if you could. We had our latest episode of The Pitch that aired on Friday. Uh, we also had our mid-year market outlook called Charting the Second Half. Larry Williams, Martin Pring have all done special events in the last couple of weeks. All of that is at StockChartsTV.com or on our YouTube channel. Check it out there as well. Let's continue on today's uh, session, today's uh, today's uh, show, looking at our market recap. As I mentioned, sort of the morning, right out of the open, sort of the surge of optimism, it felt like, right? It felt like all of a sudden there was just going to be this big, you know, incredible update powering us higher and putting an exclamation point on the bull market thesis, kind of fizzling out. And when we look at some of the candle patterns here in a minute, you'll find a lot of them are a little more distributive, actually telling you uh, short-term reversal signals. Uh, we'll look at those here in a, in a minute. I didn't look at them right going into the close. And obviously, you don't want to make too many assumptions about candle charts until the candle is done. Uh, and now after the close, we can start to draw some occlusion, uh, conclusions from it. Very quickly, the major averages basically netting out to an unchanged day. Mid caps and small caps both up about two thirds of a percent. So that part of the market actually did OK. It was the large mega cap space that struggled to VIX, pushing a little bit back higher on 2130 here at the close. Elsewhere, we have interest rates moving lower through the course of the day. It actually, the, the long bond yield settled in right around 3% for much of the uh, you know late morning uh, through the course of the afternoon session. Tenure yields around 276, 277. And bond prices obviously went higher as yields went lower. The dollar index, not too much uh, different from Friday, down just a, a click. Commodities overall uh, broadly stronger. The gold, uh, gold ETF GLD was up about 0.9%. Silver up 4%. We're going to look at that chart if we have time here. It's actually an interesting upside reversal in the chart of silver. Um, and that, again, the, the fact that the dollar sort of flats it down kind of helps give those commodities some room to move a little bit higher. And the commodity ETF, the DBC, which is more of a broader ETF, does have a decent uh, energy exposure for sure, up 1.2%. 
Cryptocurrency is a lot of green. It's interesting going into Coinbase's earnings uh, tomorrow. I uh, think after the close, I think uh, it'll be very interesting to hear. Obviously, just a lot about their business models and uh, and their outlook. But this has been quite the volatile stretch uh, for cryptocurrencies, and I know uh, places, exchanges, and elsewhere related to crypto have been struggling to sort of manage this incredible bull market in crypto that has turned into this painful bear market phase in 2022. For today, for what it's worth, Bitcoin and Ether both moving higher with Bitcoin nearing 24,000, actually was above there a little bit earlier today, this morning, uh, pulling back a little bit uh, below there, and Ether prices up about 5%, tested uh, 1800 uh, not too long ago. So interesting to see this attempt of these cryptocurrencies to push higher. To be honest with you, while stocks are kind of stalling out, trying to move higher, actually getting cryptos that are falling through a little bit uh, so far this week, for example, uh, and uh, from over the weekend, we'll have to keep those charts in mind as we pay attention to them. Daily chart of the S&P, we, we share the weekly chart on Friday show. And if you missed our Friday wrap of the week show, I would go back uh, to our uh, previous episodes and check that out uh, for sure, because we talked about the market trend model, which turned bullish um, for the first time since late March. That was on Friday's close. I had a lot of comments I shared with my premium members, just how to think about that, how to think about that in terms of risk and reward, how to think about it, risk on versus risk off. But the summary I will share with you here today is the fact that the market trend model turns bullish for me tells me to think more uh, risk on. My concern is it looked just like that in late March at the end of a bear market rally right about uh, right about there. What happened today is we sort of opened in this blue shaded area, which is 4150 to 4200. We traded higher. So earlier this morning when I brought up this chart, I, I said, all right, new closing high. Apparently, we're making it above that previous uh, swing high. Do we get to 4200 today? Of course, that changed. And by the close, we're back outside of that level. So this level, days like this, I think, just further confirm the importance of this range. When you have a retest of a resistance level and then you pull back a little bit, all I think that tells you is just confirms once again the importance of this level. Clearly, investors are looking at the individual charts that are comprising these indexes or the indexes themselves and are recognizing the fact that we are at resistance. So we're expecting it. And sure enough, we start to see the uh, reaction we're all expecting. What this also means is if and when we do get above 4,200, I would expect quite an influx of buying once investors recognize that 4,200 is no longer uh, uh, holding as resistance. And then that basically un uh, opens the door to further upside potential. The 200-day moving average, last Fibonacci retracement level, all around 4,320 to 4,330. That would probably be my next upside objective if we would break above uh, 4,200. First things first, though, let's pay attention to this blue shaded area. Not a ton of earnings. There are some this week, but uh, not as significant as in recent weeks. It's going to be more big picture uh, macro themes and just overall uh, market sentiment, I would argue, that probably drives uh, things around these, uh, the key, these key levels here. Going back to our recap today, at the top of the, of the sector list, not a great offense over defense feel by any means today. REITs were number one with the XLRE up 0.8%. That actually led the S&P 500 uh, to the upside. Communication services, then materials and energy. On the downside, technology, the worst performer. And that was really the only one that was significantly in the negative, down about 0.9%. Financials and staples, industrials, basically flat for the day, just a little bit kind of in line with the, uh, with the market uh, as a whole. So this is a little different look than what we saw last week, certainly with the FANG sectors, particularly on Wednesday, powering the market higher. And even on those other days, showing some renewed strength. And on those, a lot of those individual charts, we saw some uh, some moves uh, moves higher here. I just want to talk briefly on a couple of further charts uh, as we uh, continue to uh, to wrap the, excuse me, continue to, to recap the markets. We're going to stick big picture though, because we are getting into sectors and uh, individual stocks here in a few moments. But I would say the chart of semiconductors tells you a great deal, just like the S&P is testing resistance. The reason why the S&P is testing 4,150 to 4,200 and we cannot signal an R clear yet is because semiconductors are also testing uh, their uh, swing highs. We'll get to the chart of NVIDIA here a little bit later uh, if we can uh, in our uh, in our final segment today. But I think it's worth noting the SMH, which is sort of a bellwether group, also hitting resistance. 250 is similar to 4,200 on the S&P. You need to see semiconductors get above a key level like that. I think to validate this uptrend that we've had, for now, we're overbought as semiconductors reach their previous resistance level. That, to me, tells me more to expect resistance and expect a pullback. Today, we saw a bit of that with semiconductors down 
about 2%, a little less than that, while the S&P was uh, essentially flat. Might be an important theme to watch uh, through the course of, uh, of this week, uh, for sure. Just to finish off our discussion of big picture analysis, let's look at a chart of very quickly of breadth. And the one I wanted to do was this one. Hold on a second. Mindful investor live chart list. I was trying to remember which one uh, would be good. Yeah, this one right here. So we, we've talked about this chart in recent weeks, and I think this is another one. You know, as we as we keep talking about 4150 to 4200, that's on a closing basis. That's the top panel. Below here are all the cumulative advanced decline lines. So the small cap AD line has already gotten above its June high. The mid cap AD line actually stalled out at its June high last week and no real uh, uptick yet. These aren't updated yet for today's close. Uh, but given the fact that, fact that we were flat, I would not assume that that to be the case. Although mid caps were up, it could actually could have triggered today. Large caps and the NYSC advanced decline on that top one's the most important one to watch clearly has not eclipsed its uh, June high. So it's not enough, I think, for the S&P to get above there. You need these measures of market breadth to also confirm that there's renewed strength. And that's where I think this market still has a good deal to prove before we could uh, turn broadly bullish and start screaming, buy, 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 as if we would ever do that on the show. But we're certainly not going to do it until we get a confirmation from these breadth indicators. Let's move on to our next segment, sector setups. Let's, uh, now we've talked about the big picture. Overall, the S&P, again, facing key resistance earlier in the day, appeared like we might actually uh, get above there during the day. But by the end of the uh, the day, you saw the, uh, the market repelling that rally uh, early in the morning. Let's look at our S&P sectors. And the way we like to do that is starting with the RRG, the relative rotation graph. I was having a discussion with Julius DeKempner last week, and uh, he was on our latest episode of The Pitch, which aired on uh, Friday. And as we were preparing for The Pitch, and I was talking to my three guests to just sort of uh, strategize about our conversation, uh, Julius and I were looking at the RRG, and we were looking at a couple of different things. Remember that if when you bring up the RRG, there's a uh, drop down called Groups. And if you click there, uh, I'm I'm basically showing the S&P sector ETF visualization. It's my own version of it. That's basically what I'm showing. We also have an equal weighted version. That's an important one to look at as well, because some of these sectors like the XLY is dominated by a couple names, a couple of the uh, sector ETFs, the cap weighted ETFs, the, the tickers that you see listed out here are very much dominated by a couple big names that it, it make up. 30, 40, even 50% of the ETF. So you're really looking at the mega cap participants in those sectors when you're looking at the cap weighted ETFs. The equal weighted ETFs, a lot of times are a better gauge of just the overall structure, some of those individual stocks that make up those sectors. So check that one out as well if you're trying to get your head around uh, sector rotation, because it can be very additive and I think enhance your understanding of how these sectors are rotating. Looking at the weekly RRG, I can't help but notice that technology is really, really close. I almost thought it was it was uh, barely going to do it today, uh, but we pulled back a little bit, underperformed the uh, the S and P today. Uh, but this is looking at the weekly data. The XOK is the closest to entering into the leading quadrant at this moment, uh, Monday after the close. None of the eleven S and P sectors are in the leading quadrant. That's our leadership. That, those should be the areas in the market that are structurally sound, that are outperforming in a decent way. Zero of the eleven sectors actually fit that, which is pretty much what the market feels like right now. It's sort of in the sense in this transition period where it's unclear where the leadership has come from, where it's where, certainly where it's going to be. Worth noting to see whether or not technology makes it into the leading quadrant, you can see it's sort of stalling out a little bit in terms of the momentum. It's now going due east. If we start to rotate lower, that can get very dangerous very quickly if technology would start to underperform. The second most constructive, I would argue, is probably consumer discretionary, which is also heading northeast, which is kind of the direction you want sectors to go. All of these value-oriented sectors, some of the defensive areas like utilities, previous leadership like energy, all heading southwest. Well, worth noting, consumer staples actually rotating higher a little bit. Some of the staples charts still aren't bad, even though they've struggled a bit. The XOY and the XOP uh, have some, uh, both of them, I would say both sectors have some fairly constructive patterns that are, uh, that are evolving there. As always, pay attention to the relative strength. That is the most important takeaway that I hope you get from this uh, from the show as you watch it. Every day, I'm sure religiously, um, make sure that you recognize or, or internalize the importance of relative strength. Always important, but particularly in this kind of market where you're trying, trying to figure out where to be and where to weather these uncertain times, be in names that are outperforming. That's a great way to get through this period uh, in, a, uh, in a decent fashion. Continuing our discussion of sectors, let's look at the 11 S&P sectors using the candle glance function. And in the bottom right, we have the S&P just to be able to compare and it's interesting when you're looking at the S&P 500 testing 4,200, and this is the SPY, so it's around 
you know, four, uh, 415, 420 basically is a is a parallel to that. Look at some of the other sectors and how similar they look to uh, to that chart. Technology has already broken above its June high. You can see there real estate very, very close to doing so. It's almost a cup and handle like pattern there in the short term. Industrials stalling out uh, or testing the resistance uh, from the early uh, early June high. That could be an interesting way to see which sectors able to power above those and over the XOY, uh, you know, comes to mind as an outlier as something that's just blown right through that June high and uh, and. Uh, accelerated to the upside in a pretty good fashion here in the last uh, in the last couple of weeks. I'm intrigued by the chart of communication services, just to zoom out a little bit here. What's interesting is communication services has been such a negative sector, right? Just look at the relative strength over the last eight or nine months. From September of last year, you underperformed dramatically just having exposure to that sector. Now, individual names certainly could have had a different return profile over that period, but broadly speaking, the sector has been absolutely brutal. And look at how clear that chart rotated from accumulation phase on the left half of the chart to a distribution phase on the right side of the chart. Higher highs to lower highs, higher lows to lower lows, above the 50-day, below the 50-day, above the 200-day, below the 200-day. All these things sort of add up that show you. Now, again, the question I would be thinking as you're you know, eventually you're going to look back to 2022 as a learning experience and 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 hopefully write down in your journal somewhere, write it in a blog that I would love to read saying what I learned from the 2002 experience. And I hope one of them will be a chart like this. What did you miss or what helped you recognize that this was rotating from a position of strength to a position of weakness? The reason why I want to highlight it now is because you've seen a nice bounce on some of the names in this sector, right? The XLC um, has bounced higher from 53 up to 58. That's nice. However, it's still underperforming because other things are obviously doing doing better. This is why it's always important, again, as an exclamation point to this thought, follow the relative strength. Own things, own stocks, own ETFs, where this line is going higher. That's how you're going to do better than just parking in a passive investment fund like the S&P or an index fund, because this allows you to recognize which stocks and which areas of the market are really generating strong outperformance. Let's take a quick break. We'll be back with my next segment, Shifting Stocks. We'll see you in a minute. Hey guys, welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. We appreciate you joining us every weekday after the close for our show. A couple quick announcements. First off, we welcome your questions. We'll do a mailbag segment tomorrow on Tuesday's show with some really good questions on Friday. I had fun going through those and, uh, and thinking about how I could help uh, address your questions most effectively. Keep the questions coming and we'll do the mailbag tomorrow. Our email is the best way to get your questions to us. The Final Bar at StockCharts.com. We are on Twitter at Final Bar SCTV. So just tag us in a uh, tweet and we will get to your question. Or on our YouTube channel, just put a comment below the video you're watching there. We'll gather all those questions. Hope to answer one of yours live on the air on uh, Tuesday's show tomorrow. Also go to stockchartstv.com. We have so much great content on an average normal week, but in the last couple of weeks, it's been mid-year market outlooks. It's been special events. A lot of uh, uh, strategists and successful traders weighing in and giving you some perspective. I hope you can find Stock Charts TV helping you navigate through these uh, these choppy waters. So go to stockchartstv.com or on your mobile device, search for Stock Charts TV on demand. Let's continue on our show with our next segment, Shifting Stocks. As a reminder, um, the, the, uh, the this process that we talked through on Monday sort of mirrors my analytical process, starting big picture, looking at the overall market averages and what they're doing then going through sectors and seeing based on that big picture analysis, what sectors and themes are working, what's struggling, what's what's outperforming, what's underperforming. And then finally, the individual stocks, because it's not a stock market, it is a market of stocks. Pay attention to the individual names and stocks and themes and groups that comprise those sectors, because a lot of times uh, market movements and supply and demand is much better reflected on individual names than the indexes sort of reflect what you might be seeing. I think a lot of that has to do with the way that the indexes are very geared towards market cap. So if the largest companies aren't really showing the signal, it's more in the mid and small cap companies. Looking at individual stocks a lot of times can be really 
really instructive. Having said that, let's look at some names that are kind of uh, playing out today. Adobe's a really interesting one. So we'll start in technology. And I and I mentioned this because I feel like a lot of the charts we could look like uh, look at look a lot like this chart. This is kind of what the S&P looks like, obviously a different uh, dynamic over the last eight months in some cases, but overall topped out in November, moving lower through the course of the last eight months, and now bouncing off of the lows over the last six to seven weeks. This is off of the mid-June low. Now look what's happened. We've regained the 50-day moving average. That was encouraging. We are now testing 440, which is our, our high from June. I would argue that uh, while you know charts like Microsoft have gotten above their uh, swing highs. Apple has gotten above its high from, uh, you know, coming off of those uh, those previous lows. Some of the names like Adobe still haven't done it. And the S&P itself is still has not done it. Watching to see if more and more companies are able to get above those previous highs is vital because if we don't see any more of those, I would say the upside in uh, the S&P and the NASDAQ is limited. It's going to move higher. Those are going to move higher if names like Adobe are able to get above their previous highs. The reason why I wanted to highlight this chart is if we look at the candles, here's one of the issues you're going to find on a lot of charts today. Candlestick analysis is all a short-term analysis, which is why we don't talk about it a ton on the show, but I like to share examples when I find that they're they're helpful, they illustrate a particular point, or they have a broader um, impact or a broader uh, indication of what we might expect. I'm seeing a lot of reversal candles today. On Adobe, you could call this a couple different things. Um, you could call this a shooting star candle, which is when the open and close are near the lower end and you have a big uh, upper handle. If you call this a doji candle, which is when the open and close are right about at the same level, and it's really, really close to that, um, you actually call that, oh man, I should know this and I'm blanking on it. What is that called? A gravestone doji, I believe. Um, you can tell me in the comments if that's wrong, uh, but I'm pretty sure that's called a gravestone doji, and it has the implications, as you could expect from the name of that pattern. Looks kind of like a little gravestone. Um, that's when the open and close are the same, and you have a long upper shadow. In either case, regardless of what you want to label it, it suggests the next uh, one to three bars are most likely going to be lower. That could tell us a little bit of choppiness in the uh, in the cards uh, for uh, for some stocks this week. And again, I'm just highlighting that one. There are a number of them that have those sort of uh, patterns that I'd encourage you uh, to check out. And video was in the news today. They lowered guidance uh, today, not an earnings release. Earnings are actually uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, so interesting to kind of preempting earnings by by lowering guidance uh, going forward. Again, NVIDIA is another one of those stocks, just like Adobe has now reached its previous resistance from early June, but it's not gotten above that. Going through these charts Thursday into Friday, this was one particular chart I made a note of thinking, all right, Stocks like Nvidia get above these June highs. How much? How bearish can I be? And I and I this is something I always ask myself. I've been structurally bearish on the market. I've been looking at conditions of breadth and momentum. I just feel bear market rally in so many ways from what I've seen so far. But uh, and so I'm always questioning what would cause me to change that outlook. Adobe and Nvidia and all the other Adobe's and Nvidia's getting above their swing highs would certainly uh, prevent me from remaining bearish in any big picture way because that just tells you the more of those names that eclipse those highs, the less likely it is that we get a, a big uh, drop from here. Right? It tells you that demand is overwhelming supply, but not today. Nvidia down about six percent. So when we're looking at the chart of the SMH, one name in particular, Nvidia, is uh, is reacting to uh, guidance today. Uh, so I would I would take a look at that for sure. Uh, PLTR is another name in the uh, in the technology sector in the news today. Again, gapping lower. Uh, they had earnings before the open today, if I remember right, down about 14%. So interesting so far, not a ton of earnings uh, this week, but a couple of earnings related news uh, drop technology names down just a bit. Uh, could be worth no, uh, noting. A couple of stocks reporting earnings that I think are important to watch this week. Uh, Norwegian Cruise Lines, uh, that's Tuesday tomorrow before the open. Uh, NCLH is a really interesting chart. It's sort of this ascending triangle bottoming pattern is I guess what I would describe this as, where you basically have a downtrend, you have a consistent resistance level and increasing uh, support level looks kind of like an ascending triangle, flat resistance, uh, inclining um, lows. If we look at the candles in a bit more detail though, similar to what we saw on uh, whatever chart that was, uh, NVIDIA, Adobe, Adobe, I think. You see the same thing. You call this a shooting star candle or a, uh, a gravestone doji candle, whichever. I probably call this a shooting star candle, which is basically the open and close near the lower end of the range 
uh, and a long uh, upper range limited lower shadow. And again, that's a short term reversal signal suggesting the next one to three bars most likely lower. That's as it's attempting to get above this resistance. Note another shooting star candle back here in late June, which was uh, before the market uh, before the stock uh, dropped a little bit there. So Norwegian Cruise Line going into earnings tomorrow morning, not a great look today, pushing higher up above 14, but then closing back at the lows of the day. That's more short-term uh, distribution. Coinbase is a really interesting one. When you look at this chart, it's sort of like if NCLH validated um, the, the breakout by getting above, by gapping above that resistance level. It's kind of what happened here. 80 was the level in play for uh, Coinbase. That was from late May, early June, again in mid-July. That was the close uh, last Wednesday. And then you had the gap higher on Thursday, Friday, and now today sort of uh, continue to push higher. This chart remains above 80. That's actually not a bad chart. It's up another 5% today. Bitcoin, Ether, other cryptocurrencies actually rallying a bit today. Um, kind of continue on some uh, short-term strength from uh, from last week. That would be a really interesting dynamic if cryptocurrencies, Coinbase and others would continue to rally while stocks would actually stall out or even come down a little bit. Uh, that's kind of a, that'd be a weird dynamic uh, to pay attention to. And then just to finish off, uh, this segment on shifting stocks, I was looking at our uh, scooter uh, names. And as a reminder, if you're a Stock Charts member, which I certainly hope you are, click on, uh, go to your dashboard and click on these gears because there's a lot of really cool stuff you can add. I have a couple of my most important charts that I literally have on my dashboard so I can refer to them at all times and never get confused as to what are the most important charts that I want to keep an eye on. But I was looking down here at our scooter rankings and looking at the top 10 stocks in our large cap scooter rankings. And these are three of the top 10 PBR, which is Petrobras. This is a Brazilian oil company making a new 52 week high and a new 12 month relative high today. Here's MPWR, which is in the semiconductor space. While some of the semiconductors, like a video dropping a little bit today, MPWR actually making a new swing high on a closing basis again today. Can that hold 500? That'd be my question for that chart. Finally, CSL, Carlisle Companies, one of the top 10 stocks up a little bit today, but making a new price and relative high today. So there are strong charts out there. Use the scooter rankings, use the scanning engine. Make sure you can find those ideas. We need to wrap the show, folks. Let's go to the three and three. This is three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here's chart number one. In our market recap, we talked about a couple different big picture things. I really focused on the S&P and this range, sort of traded up into it but close back below it, uh, getting uh, below 4150. Small caps are an interesting space to watch. The SML, which is the um, uh, small cap index, S&P 600, has not quite broken uh, out yet, but the Russell 2000 actually has. IWM is the Russell 2000 ETF. That's how I like to track a broader small cap universe. Look at how it's now gotten above trendline resistance, taking the November high from last year, the March high from this year, lines up pretty well with where we were about a week ago. You can see we've powered above there and broken above trendline resistance. We've now gotten above the June high. So all the S&P has stalled out. The NASDAQ small caps in the form of the Russell 2000 ETF have gotten above there. If that can hold 190, it's actually pretty constructive. 200 would be the 200 day moving average. That's what I look at. Well, stocks overbought or the ETF is overbought, which is one concern I would have. Silver having a decent day today, up a, up a good amount. Uh, moving higher through the course of the day, up almost 4% using the XLV. Took a step back and looked at the uh, March 2020 low, the August 2020 high. Look at how these Fibonacci levels have been so beautiful and have lined up so well with key support. We bounced off of that 61.8% level last month, now testing the 50% level. We can get above 19 and hold it. That may be upside to 21. The RSI is right at 60. So it's a crucial moment to see if silver can power through there. I think there could be upside to 21 if we can get above the uh, current levels around 20. Finally, EWZ, there are ETFs that are working as well. I mentioned small caps breaking out. You also have the Brazil ETF uh, moving higher. Now, if you look at the Brazilian market, it's a lot tied to basic materials. The number one sector, if I were a member on Brazil, is probably financials. Most emerging markets kind of have financials, you know, sort of banks as their top Waiting, so I would bet that, but it's the banks all have exposure, obviously, through Brazilian companies that are focusing in that area of the space and a good energy component as well. Gapped above 30 today, and that would be the level to watch. Also, got above its 200 day moving average, could be a good breakout here and could likely mirror the movement higher in commodities, folks. That's a wrap for the show. Thanks so much for watching us. All of us, our previous episodes are at stockchartstv.com or stockcharts.com in Redmond, Washington. I'm Dave Keller. Be safe, have a great night. 
Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.